Welcome to Fellowship Safaris, conversations about people of color and their journeys to subspecialist training in their countries of origin and around the world. Hi everyone, welcome to Fellowship Safaris. My name is Jerry Kareajahe. I'm really excited. It's Monday morning in a part of the world and Monday afternoon in another. And it is my awesome privilege to be able to have the next guest on Fellowship Safaris. I will let her introduce herself and then we'll get started. So welcome, Dr. Leslie. Thanks, Jerry. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Karen Leslie. I'm a pediatrician who is also trained in the subspecialty of adolescent medicine. And I also have a master's degree in health professions education. Oh, wow. And I'm really hoping we'll be able to dive into each of those just a little bit. And I just want to start out by asking, why pediatrics, Dr. Leslie? What drew you to pediatrics? I think my whole life, I've always really loved kids. As a teenager, I you know, volunteered and had jobs in day camps, and I loved interacting with children. So I was always drawn to children. I actually had an original plan to go into teaching. My original plan was to be a teacher. So I think when I ended up in medicine, pediatrics was a nat- was I, I always knew that I was headed towards pediatrics. And it's just so interesting because during the course of the podcast, when we ask different pediatricians, it's just been really interesting that a lot of people resonate in terms of being able to teach and connecting better with the younger you know, population. So it's really exciting to hear that. And taking it a step further, why adolescent medicine? Yeah, that's an interesting one, right? Because I think we're often mm-hmm. drawn to different parts of medicine and, and we don't always think exactly what it is. But I think for me, during my pediatrics training, I trained at a center where there wasn't adolescent medicine as a subspecialty, but I really, mm-hmm. really was drawn to engaging with teenagers. There was something really unique about being able to kind of connect with a teenager, help them navigate whatever they were going through, because it's a really unique time of life. And so I think I just really, Mm -hmm. I like their sass. I like trying to get behind, you know, trying to understand the behaviors they often present with. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a real privilege to, you know, to have a develop respectful relationships with teenagers and support them in whatever direction they're going towards, you know, health and the rest of their lives. Yeah, that's really amazing. And I think one of the things that I got to love and really respect about you during the course of my Atlas Medicine Fellowship was just your passion around adolescent medicine. And like you'd mentioned earlier, the original plan was teaching. And I kind of feel that the original plan still got into place because you also mentioned medical education. How did the choice and decision about medical education come about? Yeah. So like I mentioned, I was always really drawn to teaching and, and you know, thought I was going to be a teacher initially at the end of my university undergraduate. And so when I came into medicine, you know, I had the privilege of doing um, my medical school at a school that was quite novel. It really centered around problem-based learning. So I think the medical school I, I went to intrigued me in terms of the model that they'd chosen for learning. So I think that was sort of the first time I was actually really sort of focused on you know, the various pedagogies that can be used within medical and health professions education. And then when I started my first faculty position, there were some opportunities to teach. And I think gradually, I, you know, it'll, it'll come up later when I talk about my failure in fellowship. But um, I yeah. think that, um, you know, medical education um, was an academic identity and, and one that seemed to fit. And so then I kind of pursued a path of learning more and becoming more kind of qualified, I think, in that area. For sure. I'll say hands down. I think in terms of just how I look at medical education, you played such a huge role in terms of my thoughts around it and just learning more around it. And you've been really instrumental in that. So I just want to say a very big thank you. Um, Thank you. I mean, it was my experience as well, right? That that's how I became enthusiastic and passionate about medical education because I had I had individuals that kind of modeled for me and encouraged me as well. How long have you been faculty? I know this sort of like betrays your age (laughs) a little bit, (laughs) but how long have you been faculty? 
So I, my first faculty position, I came into in 1992. So oh, wow. that, yeah, that's so, I guess that's, I have to do the math, but like 30, <laughs> yes. 30, 30 uh, oh, 31 30, years, I guess. 31 yeah. years. Oh, wow. 31 <laughs> years is not very few years. And that's journey. really, yeah, it's been a journey. And so who are some of the people that inspired you into the path? and the career path that you've been on? Yeah, so there were, I would say, in, in terms of, I mean, obviously, there are the adolescent medicine people I worked with, um, Diane Sachs, Eudis Goldberg, Miriam Kaufman, and, you know, I can name m many more of them, but people who were real champions of adolescent um, medicine in Canada, you know, very, um, lots of really strong pediatricians and adolescent medicine advocates. And then in terms of medical education, um, you know, there were a couple of pediatricians locally in Toronto, both at the university as well as the hospital. You know, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't know what they saw in me, but they, um, you know, sort of took me under their wing. They encouraged me. They gave me opportunities. You know, I think when you express an interest and you're young mm -hmm. and you're keen and enthusiastic, mm -hmm. people definitely don't want to turn you away, away from that. So I think it, there were people that really showed me that there was a career in medical education and mentored me and coached me um, and gave me opportunities. So it invited me into a community. I think that was probably the really most important part of it. I think one of the names that I recognize there is Judith Goldberg, who was the who was the first, you know, adolescent medicine specialist in the institution um, that we had done our training in. And so it was just really exciting to hear at least there's a familiar name in, you know, that adolescent medicine sphere. I just want to shift a little bit and just ask, like, um, during your career and even during your fellowship trainings, what did you find were the most influential books? If you had books or movies that you watched that were very influential for you during your time of fellowship? Hmm. I, I struggled with that question, actually, when, when I was looking at it earlier. Um, I have to say, I'm not somebody who reads a lot of nonfiction books. I have lots on my shelves, but I probably really only get through the first ten, five or 10 pages before they go back on the shelf. Um, what? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I read lots and lots of fiction, but I have to yeah. say, I, I don't read, you know, just, uh, I mean, obviously, when I was a fellow, I, I studied and I read Neinstein, which is, you know, the Bible of adolescent medicine. But yes. I think in terms of my career, I was probably more influenced by articles or papers that I read. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, there was one, there was one book that I really refer back to a lot. It's by a woman who, um, named Carol Bland. Sadly, she passed away at quite mm -hmm. a young age and didn't finish her career. But she wrote a book called um, Successful Faculty in Academic medicine and that's been mm -hmm. a very that's been a book that I've referred to a lot in terms of yeah. what she wrote about you know what you need to be successful mm -hmm. um, and again that piece around community right having a network of colleagues was one of yeah. the things that sticks in my head the other is a paper actually written by a colleague of mine Susan Leaf it was in academic medicine a number of years ago and it, it mm -hmm. really talks about meaningful work Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I keep coming back over and over again to that paper because it really talks about meaningful work being at the intersection of your values, your passions, and your strengths. And mm -hmm. I come back to that a lot. And I use that a lot in the teaching that I do around career development and mentorship. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because when we talk about meaningful work, especially when we go into fellowship training, we're so like into the didactic, academic, and, you know, just being able to just take a moment and interweave it with our purpose and having a more meaningful output has been one of those things that I think was a struggle for me in fellowship. For you, what is the, you know, one of the things that you do that helps you actively practice, you know, meaningful practice for you? I mean, I think it's going back to what's important, right? I actually think at the end of the day, so much of what we do is relational, right? And so I think mm -hmm. relationships with patients and caregivers, relationships with colleagues, relationships with the other important people in my life, right? I, th I think really at the end of the day, it's how you cultivate those relationships, what you put into those relationships and what you get from those relationships, right? I think, you know, the obviously content is important. You need to be an expert in your field. I think as a faculty member, you have a bit more of a luxury to maybe, you know, not have to spend so much time worrying about content and you can focus a bit more on process and relationships. At the end of the day, I think that's what it's all about, right? Really focusing on the relationships and, and that's yeah. where the meaning, the meaning comes from. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. And in terms of when you look back, what was like a belief 
or behavior that you had picked up during fellowship that continue to help improve who you are as a person and as a clinician? You know, I think maybe it's being curious. I think it's trying as much as possible to be open to different possibilities, to be able to really work on listening, uh, listening to the young people that we work with, you know, hearing them, not just listening, but hearing hearing them and, and hearing other people's perspectives, even though they might not be ones you share or ones that you would immediately, you know, kind of align your own thoughts with. Again, you know, I think it's an ongoing challenge. I, I don't profess to be able to be doing it as well as I would like all the time, but yeah, it's it's something that I strive and, and really want to be deliberate about in, in the work that I do. And I'd like to say that you have been deliberate because I feel that you were one of the people that just by your curiosity about finding out what my experience was really helped me navigate some of the hurdles that I encountered and also just helped me explore other aspects in terms of my, you know, skill set and gifts and talents. So I know that you say it's a continuous thing and I just want to reflect back to you that it has been really helpful because I've been a recipient of you being curious and you really hearing me. So thank you so much, Dr. Leslie. Well, it's nice to be validated, right? I think, you know, we all try Mm -hmm. to do certain things and it's nice to get feedback that other people are actually noticing and appreciating. So thank you. Yeah. It sounds like you've had a a lot of successes in terms of your career. And, you know, as uncomfortable as this question is, did you experience any failure during fellowship? And, you know, could you give us an example? Yeah, definitely. Right. You know, we, we learn so much more from our failures than our successes, I think. Um, I, I would say one failure during my fellowship training was really um, my inability to really complete uh, a research project. You know, in our, in our academic training, you know, there's often this idea that we need to we need to develop skills in research. And, you know, when I did my fellowship, you know, it wasn't a structured Royal College, you know, sort of mm-hmm. uh, program. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't actually get, I would say, intentional preparation to engage in clinical research. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of just sort of barreled into a project. Um, and I remember actually having one of my supervisors, not from my own clinical area, but in another area, essentially kind of yell at me because I didn't do a lot of things no. right. Um, oh, no. And, you know, and I kind of, you know, finished my fellowship and actually started my faculty position, really thinking that maybe academic medicine wasn't a place for me because I didn't really have skills or feel very confident in my ability to engage in clinical research. So I think I didn't realize that medical education was an academic career at the time. And so I think mm-hmm. I really, you know, that was really uh, again kind of an uncomfortable feeling and sort of a feeling mm-hmm. like maybe I was I, I didn't have what I needed to be successful yeah that sounds really tough and I think especially when you talk about research there are a lot of people who resonate with that in terms of not having had a very good experience and giving up pretty early once you have had that nasty experience so to speak and in terms of the success out of it you know how did it set you up I know you talked about medical education. How did it improve your approach to to research and to other learners? I mean, I think what it told me when I started my first faculty position is that I didn't actually have the training and I wasn't actually even really sure whether that was my thing in terms of pursuing additional training specific to kind of clinical research. I knew I wanted to obviously contribute. Um, so I think the fact that I didn't feel prepared or even feel that that was necessarily a career path for me um, maybe opened the door for me then to actually realize that 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 medical education and health professors education could be a career and that there was some deliberate training and preparation and learning that I could do to equip me with having an academic career in that area. So and essentially it, you know, it, it sort of showed me a door that really wasn't maybe one that I wanted to go through or was <laughs> I'd been prepared to go through. And then it allowed me to see another door that I took, which which ended up being, you know, the right one for me. So I think you know, wow. in terms of how that translates to, to lots of other people, I mean, I think, you know, mm-hmm. I think we, we talk more about academic careers and what it means to be engaged in scholarly work more with our learners, because I, I think there are still people that feel they start a career in an academic center. And as long as they're a good clinician, that's sort of enough. And, you know, quickly realize that, that that's a given and that you need to be looking at other ways to contribute to sort of the academic mission. So I think those are the conversations that I try to encourage people to have or, 
you know, thinking a little bit about what are those different academic pursuits? How can you be scholarly? How can you contribute to the academic mission and further the field that you're practicing in? And to be starting to think about that early and talking to different people who are doing different things um, that they love that are academic and scholarly to kind of find your thing or at least get a sense of what area it might be in. It's it's great to hear that that's what came out of the the failure of um, <laughs> uh, during that time because because that's amazing it was so fruitful it was well you know a it was much all in hindsight right <laughs> yes <laughs> all yes in retrospect. I, yes all in retrospect. You told me about a document and actually a development program for medical educators of international medical graduates. So how did a program of this nature come about? Yeah, so I wasn't in, I was more involved with the kind of um, piloting it of, of it at, at the university site I was at, but the Association of Faculties of Medicine Canada, which is a national organization representing all 17 medical schools in Canada, um, had an initiative quite a number of years ago, I would just say it's almost 15 or 20 years ago, I can't remember the date on the document I shared with you. Um, but it was really around, you know, you know, Canada, um, and as of many countries have a lot of international medical graduates um, coming to do training to, to practice and become faculty members. Um, and so I don't actually know the impetus for this, but it was a very needed document to really try to help teachers understand and support and help international graduates be successful in a different learning and practice culture. That's so interesting that this this concept was 15, 20 years ago. And is it a document that's used in all, if not most, like medical schools across Canada, or is it in a few specific ones? Yeah, so to be honest, I don't, you know, the the initial push, there was some funding offered to different schools to actually do to the demonstration projects. And so at our university, the center that I was involved in leading um, or working at, which was focused on faculty development, you know, got a grant to be able to implement and introduce this resource um, through workshops and some other activities at our center for different medical educators and teachers. And I think similar schools across Canada did. I think the document is still being used at a few of the faculty development centers or a few of the universities in Canada. I'm, I'm not sure how, how much it's currently used across Canada. There certainly had been a big push for it to be used. I mean, you know, you could argue that it's maybe a little out of date now and there may be some concepts, you know, certainly some of the language and some of the terms used. There are probably different words that are used used now. So I think that it may, it still has relevance, but it probably needs some updating, I would say. It's, it, I think it's very relevant. When I sat down and read the document, if it's all right for us to be yeah. able to just talk about it a little bit more, why is it important for, for teachers to develop an understanding of the international medical graduate as a learner and as a physician? Yeah. You know, I mean, I think it's it's hugely important because I think, you know, we make um, we make a lot of assumptions based on behaviors or ways trainees interact with us. And some of those assumptions influence how we might formally assess them or you know judge them. And yet I think if there's a whole layer behind kind of uh, cultural, I mean, there's so many layers, right, of power of differentials and dynamics and distance between teachers and students in, in across different cultures. So we make assumptions about what we expect learners to be doing and asking questions, those kinds of things without actually appreciating that for many learners, that would something be something they would never do because it would be a sign of disrespect. So I think there are so many layers around, again, those um, how power differentials play out within medical education even things like the concept of feedback, you know, again, if somebody's here as an international learner and they want to stay and feedback may be perceived as as more of a, an evaluation rather than more of a formative for your own learning. And then I think, you know, again, systems of care, you know, language, you know, English as a second language. There are just so many layers that I think teachers need to be cued to and aware of and try to understand so that they can modify, shift, appreciate how they're engaging and supporting learners in, in this system, in this Canadian system, uh, who may not be familiar with it at all. 
No, that's that's really quite something because I think for me coming into a space where being acknowledged as a learner and as a physician, but then it wasn't equal, you know, just among all cadres of of healthcare. You know, um, there are some who acknowledge that yes, this is a pediatrician coming in for further training, but for others, there was just a blanket. You know, this is an IMG. They just don't know the system. So it's really insightful to hear that there are some people who've put some thought into this, and I'm hoping that this will be the first conversation of it and sort of like lead to an update so that it's more proactively used in more medical schools. And it's helpful to just hear, you know, your perspective about that. And I'm just wondering, you know, as a teacher and as an educator, do you have any examples of ways that teachers and supervisors have been barriers to learning for international medical graduates? whether intentionally or unintentionally? Yes, I mean, I I can only share the kinds of things that I've both seen and heard from from trainees, right? And Mm -hmm. I want to be really clear, like, you know, my my position as a, you know, as a as a white, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. uh, privileged um, woman, you know, who did grow up in Scotland, so did emigrate to, you know, to Canada from another country, but, you Mm -hmm. know, don't even profess to really understand those experiences. Mm-hmm. Certainly, I have seen international medical graduates, again, like I said, you know, not be respected for the knowledge and expertise that they have. I see, you know, again, comments about people, you know, not having taken time to understand the system, people making assumptions about learners around what they don't know, or, you know, how, how they should have been better prepared. So I think a lot of, I mean, I think the big thing I see is a lot of assumptions been made without actually people asking, oh, so, you know, what's your background? What have you done in this area? Are there some things I can help you with, right? So that appreciation um, of all of the challenges um, international medical graduates are facing and almost like a dismissal that any of those things should actually influence their performance, right? No, that's that's really it's interesting to hear that from your perspective, you know, you've seen some of these things sort of playing out. And I think for me, having been in the Canadian system coming in as a Kenyan fellow, it was a bit cognitively confusing because in some spaces people were very gracious and really extended, you know, just you know, help me understand, you know, coming in with a lot of curiosity just to make sure that we're on the same page. And in other instances, it was assumed that I lacked the competence to do certain things. And so it was interesting in this documentary, a statement that said that cultural differences can be misinterpreted as a lack of competence or confidence. And how can we help teachers? Because I think even just looking, yes, across Canada, but also around the world. I feel like fellowships, because there are very few places that do offer subspecialist training, we've become sort of like this global village. There's a lot of immigration to different countries. What are some of the ways that teachers and educators can move from this, uh, you know, space of misinterpretation of a lack of competence and confidence into more understanding of the international medical graduate? Yeah. I mean, I think there are ways we can do it embedded into things that we currently do in our system. So, you know, there there, are, you know, because I've worked in faculty development, you know, we often talk a little bit about orientation, you know, orientation of the learner to the teacher, of the teacher to the learner and the learner to the environment. Right. Those three pieces of what it means to orient a learning interaction. And so I think we need to be for all learners, but particularly for international medical graduates to be able to really make sure that those three pieces are happening at the beginning of a rotation, at the beginning of an encounter in clinic. You know, there are different ways to do this in small ways, but that just those simple little questions, right, about this is who I am, this is kind of what I'm doing in the clinic. How about you? You know, kind of, you know, have you worked in this area before? What's your past experience? What are you hoping to get out of this learning? And, you know, and here's a little bit of an orientation to kind of what the clinic flow is or the hospital setup. So I think that Focusing on that orientation piece and seeing, emphasizing how important it is for all learners, and in particular for learners who are new to the system, new to a country, practicing in a, a language you know that they're less comfortable in when they were super comfortable practicing in in the language you know their their primary language in their home countries. 
So I think that orientation piece is really important and should be part of every learner's rotation. And I think that that's a way to then, you know, embed some specific questions people might ask for, for learners who are new to the country. It's so interesting that you mentioned that. And it sounds so, you know, so simple. And yet it's so it goes such a long way in terms of being able to help the international medical graduate. And I'm thankful that you've mentioned that. Another statement that I sort of read it and I want to hear like what your view is or what your input is, framing cultural awareness and responsiveness as a process of lifelong learning. When you hear this statement, what comes to mind and, you know, what are practical ways for us to think about this? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, culture, you know, there's a lot of focus, obviously, in, you know, in our learning and practice environments around looking at anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism, certainly in Canada, um, we're having lots of conversations about that. And anyway, and again, I, you know, I think it's not one thing, right, cultural awareness, or, you know, just whatever words we used to use, cultural competence, and that's not a word that we would use anymore. So I think this awareness and this explicit recognition that people are coming into the spaces that we practice and learn in with different with different traditions with different ways of being with different ways of relating to different people in those spaces and so we can continue to learn about you know very specific things that might relate to people from particular cultures and i think at the same time we're never going to know everything about every single culture and the nuances and so i think that lifelong learning piece is that piece around asking questions and and being curious and wanting to learn from people who come into the you know to work with us you know, who are bringing diversity and, and it enriches us all to be able to learn more about that diversity and then be able to best work with each other. No, that's that's really helpful to hear. And I hope there's an educator who will be able to listen to this episode and have some practical tips that they can be able to apply for an international graduate who's coming into their department or into their division. And what are practical ways that you know, we can advocate for continuous training and sensitization and even, you know, an update or a document of this nature. What are some practical mm-hmm. ways that we can get involved with that process? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things I didn't mention is that I don't think the onus should necessarily always be on the individual learner, international medical graduate learner, to be the person that necessarily, I mean, I think it is important that they're able to kind of either you know, introduce themselves and maybe include some of the key things that they might want people to know just in those, you know, more informal introductions. And at the same time, I do think that it's important for program directors or kind of leaders in education to be actually providing some of that information to help people understand, you know, who learners are and some of the, maybe the differences um, between a learner who's coming from another country versus a locally grown (laughs) learner you know, I think leaders, I think program directors, I think medical education leaders, other leaders have a responsibility to be able to, again, setting the stage and setting the expectation um, and helping people think about this. And then at the kind of individual ground level, there could be some more pieces around that orientation that I mentioned. You know, I think, again, in any country, I, th- I think having having formal faculty development or having opportunities to be able to really help people think about these issues because again people are not necessarily not well-meaning they just may not have ever really thought about the kinds of things that they should be thinking about when they're helping support the learning environment for a learner that's new to the country that's really helpful to hear and i hope one of the things that again like i mentioned earlier that this this podcast would be sort of like a bit of a clarion call to different educators about how we interact with international medical graduates and, you know, sort of like flipping the question on the other side, when you think about what have been some ways that your interaction with international medical graduates has helped mitigate some of these issues for future graduates. I say this from the perspective of, you know, like adolescent medicine and, you know, having had a few of the international graduates come through the division Are there any like learning points from different interactions with different fellows that has helped the division and has helped you, you know, be able to have a better approach for other upcoming international graduates? 
Yeah, I have to say, like, I don't necessarily think we've always done a good job of this. So, I, I mean, I, I do want to really thank you, Derry, for doing this podcast, because this podcast is going to be a, an invaluable resource that I'm going to be using now. And I've mentioned it to a number of people, both within within our hospital and other programs and elsewhere. So I do think that this is such an important resource for people um, to be able to understand the stories and the experiences of international medical graduates. I think, you know, little things, I think sometimes just that appreciation of language. We had a, a trainee a number of years ago who kind of came and said, you know, there's just so many different uh, sayings that I don't understand. You know, what does out in left field mean? And it's a baseball reference, right? And so there are so many different words that we use or little, you know, slang terms or phrases that really are, don't translate, right, internationally. So, you know, I think one thing is kind of just asking people to kind of come and talk about those things. If there's some terms that you're, that trainees are hearing that they don't understand just in colloquial language, you know, to kind of either ask in the moment or come and ask me so uh, we can kind of just help people understand some of that local kind of you know lingo but I think at a more practical level just just this week actually um, I did a session for some of the staff on the ward uh, really just to talk about the different kinds of learners that we have because oftentimes staff you know, who are maybe not from medicine, don't really understand the distinction between different sort of layers of trainees from medical student to resident to subspecialty fellow, um, and even the distinctions between the fellows we have in our program. So I think, you know, and again, I was quite amazed. They were really curious. They asked some questions that re really made me feel bad that we hadn't done the session like this before, because they, and I think they really had a lot of empathy that I don't sure that they necessarily had before when we really talked about kind of what it's like to come to a new hospital and be a trained pediatrician in your home country and be a learner and have people assume that you you know don't have the expertise that you do have. So I think even just having those conversations, but again, doing that deliberate kind of in-service and training and some, you know, bringing a formality, I think, into talking about um, some of these issues. Uh, maybe one other thing, you know, I think something that we've tried to do at the beginning of each year is send around a photo as well as a little bit of a background about new trainees, all of our trainees, um, including international trainees, to really just help people know a little bit about them in terms of, again, trying to emphasize what their past experience is and and help people kind of see where they're coming from, if they're bringing families with them, if they're not bringing families with them. And all of those things are so important for people to know to be able to really develop relationships and work effectively with, with international graduates. Let me just say that I'm a partial recipient of people just being able to read, you see my picture and read a little bit about me. And I remember like one of the first things that helped me, you know, sort of feel welcome was, you know, people just asking, how's your daughter doing? Has she settled in? And I'm just like, have I mentioned my daughter in a conversation that I realized, oh yeah, it was part of my bio that you know they received and for me it was really you know it gave me this warm feeling because at least you've read the bio and at least you have an you know an awareness that there's this person who's come in from far away and you know let's just make her feel at home and so that picture and bio really went a long way and so I just want to say thank you because it went a really long way. And do you have any final thoughts about this paper and document that had gone out for training of teachers? Any final words or thoughts about it before we move on? Um, I think the only thing, again, you know, is to layer it on those pieces of, you know, the things that we take for granted in our medical education and learning culture, right, about you know, students spontaneously asking questions or engaging in clinical discussions that, you know, that we that we highly value and see as signs of engagement or interest, right? So I think it's so important that we look at, okay, here are the reasons that learners who haven't actually trained in our system may or may not be behaving in the ways that we would interpret as being engaged or interested or those kinds of things. So I think it really is important that we that we look at the pedagogy that we value and that we introduce and think a little bit about how to actually introduce that to learners that haven't actually learned in that system and also to be to be encouraging them to say these are the things that other teachers are going to be looking for and you know just again so that we're not we're not judging people in a in a way that doesn't align with what they're used to being so that sort of those expectations for 
teachers and students who are coming from other systems to be able to really be understanding why the things that we might be observing or looking for may not be taking place and how to actually bridge that gap. What advice would you have to somebody who's thinking about starting a fellowship? And, you know, what are some of the pieces of advice you'd give to that person who's thinking about a fellowship? Yeah, so, I mean, I mean, it's always that piece around, you know, where, you know, thinking down the road, right? You know, kind of how am I going to be able to use this training? Are other people valuing me getting this training? Because I do think that, sure, you need to take some risks and follow an interest you have. I think you really want to be, though, uh, doing some work even before you might even be thinking about applying or leaving to go somewhere else to say, you know, who might be interested, who's in a position of power, authority, where I'm currently working or in my, my country or in my university or in my hospital. How can I position this learning as something that's going to be of value to other people in addition to being of value to myself? So I think doing a little bit of that preparation as to, you know, what am I going to be bringing back? And how can I help people see that what I'm going to be doing is going to be value in my home country or my home hospital? Um, And then I think it's a matter of kind of looking at where are the options, you know, again, many of the considerations that some of your colleagues have talked about in previous podcasts, right, around understanding countries and partners and children and all of those pieces around where might you want to spend some time. And then I think it's really having conversations with the fellowship program director in the places you're interested in to really understand, is there going to be some flexibility if there's going to be particular areas of focus that you really see are going to be most useful for when you come back to your home and really being able to try to sort of negotiate a little bit around, you know, what that learning could look like and what you're going to do with it when you come back. So I think it's that, you know, thinking in the future and then really being able to prepare yourself for what it is that you want to be learning and then, you know, connecting and really getting an understanding of what the other, the people in the program are like, um, what, what they're like to work with, you know, is there some flexibility around how, what your learning will look like. Um, And again, there may or may not be, but I think it's that piece around a bit of a negotiation, perhaps around understanding what it could look like, because at the end of the day, you want it to meet your needs and the needs of wherever you're going to be hoping to enact your learning. Now, that's really helpful to hear. And also just to reinforce that the program director of the program that you're going into is a resource, you know, not just somebody who you submit documents to and, you know, lets you know what the schedule is going to look like, you know, broadly, but also a resource in terms of what is available to you. What are some of the different things that you can do within the division that will build and grow you as a fellow? So I appreciate you mentioning that. I think because for a lot of people, like let's, let me say from from my context, I did not, you know, before doing my fellowship, I didn't really lean into you know, like the head of department being a a resource in terms of having a conversation about what is possible, you know, uh, what would be helpful, what are some of the things that I can do in my time, you know, of learning in that particular program. I think it's really important that I emphasize that communicate with your program director before you start and, you know, keep that communication line going. And even after you're done with the fellowship, I found that staff and even the program director is really helpful in terms of helping you think through some next steps and, you know, bouncing off ideas that you might have or challenges in terms of care that you might encounter. What advice would you have to a fellow who's about to finish their program and, you know, they just need some nuggets? What what would be your nugget for them as they're preparing to go out into the job market? Oh, that's a, that's a tough one because it's big, right? I, I mean, I think the one thing is take it slow, right? You know, I think there's this push to kind of jump into the perfect position and to be able to kind of have exactly what you want. And actually, I think sometimes it's actually better not to jump into something full time and have it taking up your time because then you don't necessarily have a chance to explore other options. So I think it's to take it easy to know that you're probably going to be presented with lots and lots of opportunities don't say yes right away to everything. I think that's my advice in general in life is, you know, if an opportunity is presented itself, don't say yes in the moment, even if you know you might eventually want to say yes or have to say yes, depending on who's asking. But try to put a little bit of space in between 
an opportunity or a request that's given to you and you actually saying yes to it, because I think when you think a little bit about it, you can say yes. And I wonder if, if I'm doing this, I could also do this. So there's sometimes, sometimes an opportunity to negotiate and ask. Um, and it just gives you time. Sometimes if you're overloaded and feeling it's too much and feel that you can decline a request, then it gives you a bit of space to say, you know what, this sounds really great. You know, could you ask me again, you know, in six months at this point in time, I just don't think I could do it justice. So I think it's that piece around knowing that you don't have to say yes to everything knowing that sometimes you do have to say yes to certain requests, being able to pace yourself a little bit because, you know, it's easy to get overloaded and you need to give yourself some time just to figure out your new identity as a faculty member and get a sense of what are the things that you want to be doing with your career. Thank you so much. It's so valuable. And I feel like I know we're recording this podcast and I know you and I have had many conversations, but I'm always feeling really refreshed when you and I talk because I'm just like, yes, ooh, I'm going to apply this. Oh, yes, I need to remember this. So I am really grateful, Dr. Leslie, that you took the time to talk to me about this topic and also just to let us know about different possibilities and things that we need to think about when it comes to medical education. It's my absolute pleasure. I, I uh, Yeah, it's thank you for asking me and thank you for doing this podcast. Yeah, thank you. So you've heard it, folks, and I, I'm really excited that we had this opportunity with Dr. Leslie. I wish you all a great day. Bye. I'm so glad you stayed tuned. Please get the word out and share it with at least three people. Make this episode like a chain letter. Share it, share it, share it. Come back for the next leg of our safari, where we'll be talking about... In my capacity as a psychotherapist working with so many physicians and hearing about the challenges they face and the complexity of the decisions they must make, encourage me to want to facilitate a process for them to make use of and value that emotional experience in order to bring their practice more to life and to combat burnout. Listeners are advised to use their own judgment and discretion when applying any information discussed in this and all podcast episodes to their specific situation. Always seek the advice of a qualified professional if you have any concerns or questions regarding a particular subject matter. You can find this and other episodes of this podcast on our website at www.fellowshipsafaris.org. You can also find all our episodes on all podcast platforms. Reach out to us on social media as Fellowship Safaris on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And our Twitter handle is at fellowshipsafar. You could also send us an email on fellowshipsafaris at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you and interacting with what you have to say about the Fellowship Safaris podcast. It takes a village to make this podcast. The executive producer and original music is done by Mokavi Maweu. The sound engineer is Tevin Sudi with thanks to AQ Studios. Graphic design was done by Benjamin Mboya. We would like to give a special shout out to Josephine Karianjahe and Melissa Mbogwa of Africa Podfest. All rights reserved by Dr. Jerry Karianjahe and the Fellowship Safaris podcast. <laughs>